Good morning, congregation. Let's pray. Father God, it is so great that we can come together, not just here physically, but also through technology. Lord, that we can hear your word through our brother Herman. Lord, we are so blessed with so many people in our congregation that have got skills and the wisdom, the talents that you've given them, Lord. And we pray that you will use Herman today to speak to us, Lord, that we will hear your word, and that you will bless him and give him the energy and the wisdom to speak to us in the way that you want. Lord, so we will learn about your love and your grace and your peace, and that we can share that as we go out and be the light to the world for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 11, where we read the story of Lazarus. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethlehem, uh, from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to the Lord. Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. And he said this, and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm on my way to wake him up again. He said, then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. But they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that, he wasn't, that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than three miles away, two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. As soon as Mary heard him, heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, 
saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, and they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, unwrap him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary saw what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and were saying, what are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You're not considering that it is to your advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish? He did not say this on his own. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. In Jerusalem, the Jews had tried to stone Jesus. And so he left there and went to the other side of the River Jordan. Now where exactly it doesn't say, but he must have been some distance from Bethany where Mary, Martha and Lazarus lived. Because after he received the news about Lazarus' illness, he stayed there where he was for another two days before going there. When he knew that Lazarus had died, he travelled to Bethany. And by the time he got there, Lazarus had already been dead four days. Lazarus' death came as no surprise to Jesus. In fact, he was waiting for it. He knew what he was going to do well before this happened. Oh, he could have healed him from where he was because he'd already demonstrated that he didn't need to be there to heal someone. He showed this with the healing of the official son. When the official came to him in Cana, Jesus said to him, you may go, your son will live. And he was instantly healed. His son was in Capernaum, some 38 kilometres away. But this whole event was not going to be about Lazarus, but about Jesus. About his sonship. His sonship of Almighty God about his divine power, about his true identity. He was going to show his authority over all things, even death. And in so doing, he was going to give yet another proof of who he really was. Yes, he'd already raised Jairus' daughter from death and also the widow of Nain's son. But this was different. There would be no disputing this one. 
He was going to give a proof that was beyond all doubt. And so he said to his disciples, we're going to Bethany. Now, for obvious reasons, they didn't think this was a very good idea. After all, they just tried to kill him in that very vicinity, as Bethany is only about 3K from Jerusalem. They also knew that anyone associated with him had a good chance of suffering the same fate. But to their credit, they showed their love for Jesus and their loyalty to him by being prepared to go and face the dangers with him. And so they went. And when they got close to Bethany, Martha was told that Jesus was on the way and she went out to meet him. She'd known Jesus for a long time and considered him a dear friend. But she was somewhat confused and said, Lord, if you'd been here, you could have healed him. If you'd been here, nothing like this need have happened. Lord, where were you? Why didn't you come when we called you? You knew we needed you. But then her true faith kicked in and she made one of the great testimonies in Scripture. But I know, Lord, yes, I know, I don't just believe, I don't suspect, I know that even now, after Lazarus has been dead all this time, God will give you whatever you ask him. What an incredible statement of faith. She may not have realised it, but she prophesied the raising of her brother back to life. He then tells her that Lazarus will rise again, but she doesn't realise that he isn't talking about some, some future event, but the right there and then. And then comes a lesson not just for Martha, but for all who have put their trust in Jesus, including you and me. Jesus proclaims, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Here Jesus tells the world that he has the power over life and death, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And to all who put their trust in him, he promises to grant eternal life. He then follows this up with a question that each one of us has to answer for ourselves. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? There were those who witnessed this great miracle who chose not to believe. But Martha answered with this wonderful confession. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you are the Son of God who has come into the world. When we think of Martha, we tend to think of busy Martha, frustrated Martha, complaining Martha, who felt that all the work was left up to her while others took the easy way out. But here we see the faithful Martha, the believing Martha, the humbly submitting Martha, the proclaiming the truth about Jesus Martha. She wasn't afraid to nail her colours to the mast and proclaim her faith in Jesus to all who were there, including the doubters, including those who would later tell on Jesus, including those who would wish him harm. And this was before he even raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus then tells her to go and call Mary. He apparently didn't want to go into the house where she was surrounded by all the mourners for he didn't come to mourn for Lazarus. He didn't need to mourn for Lazarus because he knew exactly what he was going to do. He mourned for the mourners. When Jesus saw the grief that Mary displayed and how much she was hurting, when he saw how much the death of Lazarus had affected his loved ones, when he saw their genuine grief and feelings of helplessness, he couldn't help but cry with them because he was full of compassion and felt their pain. And so we come to the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. It says that he was deeply moved 
Now, the Greek word used here is a very strong word that can also be interpreted as angry, upset. Jesus was angry. Angry at evil, angry at sin, angry at the suffering that had caused God's people. In a note in this word in the Bible, it says that it referred to Jesus' anger against sin's tyranny and death. Yes, he wept. He wept for the weeping. He wept for the sorrowful. He wept for the brokenhearted. This same Jesus who is now seated at the right hand of the Father still weeps for the weeping, still weeps for the sorrowful, still weeps for the brokenhearted because he is still full of compassion for his loved ones. And he's still angry at the suffering caused by the tyranny of sin and death. And even though he can see the future of those who love him and that all things will work for our ultimate good, that we will indeed live forever with him, he weeps with us when we weep. He mourns with us when we mourn and calls us to come to him so that he may, we may have his peace, that he may comfort us. He will dry our tears and gently hold us in his arms. The love of our Lord knows no bounds as he demonstrated not long after these events when he went to that terrible cross. He then went to the grave where Lazarus lay and once again he was deeply moved. He was still angry at evil and sin which had brought this about and told him to roll the stone away. But Martha protested, Lord, by now he'll have started decomposing and there'll be a bad smell. But Jesus insisted because here he would show power that no one could dispute. No one could claim that Lazarus wasn't really dead, that he was in some kind of coma or was a deep sleep or in a drunken stupor. This could not have been staged or faked in any way. With the smell that came from that tomb, all doubts about Lazarus' condition would have been completely evaporated and he was well and truly dead. When that was fully established, Jesus called out to the Father, letting the people know where his power came from. And so he thanked the Father so everyone could hear and, and he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And when Jesus, the Son of God, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, commands something to do something, there is no choice but to obey. When Jesus tells bread to multiply, it multiplies. When he tells a storm to be still, it is still. When he tells water to become wine, it becomes wine. And when he tells a decomposing body to regenerate and come back to life, it regenerates and comes back to life. And Lazarus stood up and came out of the tomb, not as some kind of zombie, a walking dead person, but a complete, healthy, normal, fully restored human being. And this was proved in the next chapter, where sometime later Jesus came and had dinner with them and reclined at the table with Lazarus. But there we also read that the priests and the Pharisees decided to kill him to kill Lazarus because they were being ignored and the people were following Jesus on his account. Just imagine standing among the crowd that day and witnessing this. This was a jaw-dropping, amazing miracle. No normal human being could ever have brought this about. Can you imagine not believing in him at that moment? Could you imagine turning around and saying, this proves nothing? Yet although many put their faith in him, some were not convinced and went and told the Pharisees what had happened. Even this was not enough to convince them. This was after he'd already healed people of diseases, made the blind see, the deaf hear, turned water into wine, walked on water and fed a whole crowd of people with just a few loaves of fishes, twice. But still, for some people, 
it wasn't enough. Just like today, for some people, it's not enough. It's never enough. And then there was the reaction of the chief priests and the Pharisees. These were the most religious people in the land, the ones who prided themselves most on their relationship with Almighty God. Ironically, these were the people especially set aside to minister by God, to minister to him, and here they actively opposed the Son of God and plot his death. They had a wonderful opportunity at this point to come to Jesus and humble themselves before him, seeking forgiveness for their lack of faith, acknowledging him as the Messiah and to minister to him. But listen to what it says in verse 47 that we just read before. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. Notice, they didn't say, maybe we should reassess our opinion of him. Maybe we have it wrong. Maybe he is the Messiah. No, instead, they had a great discussion about this and after the advice of the high priest, the man who stood in the shoes of Aaron and who had been especially set aside by God himself to be the chief minister before him, decided that the best course of action was to kill him, to kill the one who was proclaimed the Messiah, the Son of God, to kill the one for whom angels sang and for whom wise men came from afar. When the Sanhedrin made this decision, little did they realise that they were doing exactly what God's plan wanted them to do. That Caiaphas, the high priest, was actually prophesying. But make no mistake, this does not in any way exonerate them from responsibility. They made this decision of their own free will. Jesus demonstrated with the raising of Lazarus that he was the master. He was in control. And this was borne out even at the crucifixion. For at the cross, <clears throat> for on the cross, that, on that cross, Jesus had his finest hour. It was on the cross where he won the victory over Satan, over sin, over death itself. We often refer to Jesus being raised from the dead, but is this actually accurate? Shouldn't we instead be referring to him as raising himself from the dead? In John 10, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to to take it up again. I, Jesus, have been given all power and authority. There is nothing that is not under my power, including death, so that I don't need anyone, not even the Father, to help me to take up my life again. For the Father was the one who gave me this authority. No, no. The Father put all things under the feet of Jesus, as we can read in Ephesians 1, even death. I and the Father are one. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. So when Jesus came out of the tomb on that incredible Easter Sunday, he had exercised his own authority to take up his life again. And why is this important? Because it demonstrates that he who is the resurrection and the life is without limitation. There is nothing beyond him. Even death could not hold him. So when we put our faith in this Jesus, as Martha did, we put our faith in the one who is without limitation. The one who can literally do all things. The one who is truly equal with the Father and takes his rightful place in the Godhead. So when he makes the promise, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. It is a promise that he is well and truly able to keep. 
So what uh, responses do we see to the raising of Lazarus? Well, there are those who accept this and rejoice accepting Jesus as their Lord. There are the sceptics who, even though they see what happened with their own eyes, still can't accept Jesus for who he really is. And they run off and report what they've seen to the priests and the, and the Pharisees. And then there are those who not only don't accept, but actively oppose him to the point of plotting to kill him. The third response was that of the priests and the Pharisees. And they did this for three main reasons. Firstly, because he didn't fit in with their interpretation of the law. They felt that anyone who did not follow what they saw as God's commandment could not be from God. Doesn't sound that unreasonable, does it? In John 9 we read, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Secondly, because of fear that they would lose what they had. In Matthew, Jesus accuses the priests and, and the Pharisees of greed when he confronts them. And here we see that they're scared that the Romans might take away their position and their lifestyle. And thirdly, because of jealousy. In John 12, the Pharisees say to each other, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the world, world has gone after him. The people were ignoring them and following Jesus. And that's also why they decided to kill Lazarus. But we need to also be careful that we don't fall into any of these traps. We can be so zealous for our particular interpretation of the Bible that we aren't willing to even consider those who have a slightly different view as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be afraid of losing our identity, our uniqueness, if we alter what has been our tradition for generations, putting our traditions ahead of the Scriptures. Or we may be afraid of losing our position. Or we can cast jealous eyes at other Christians who may appear to be more successful than us and try to emulate them for all the wrong reasons or even discredit them. All these attitudes are human attitudes. They're about us and our wants, our needs, our cares, our concerns. But when we look at our Lord Jesus and the example he gives, we see that he didn't care what others thought of him or about the consequences of his actions, except that they brought glory to God. His only concern was the Father. And this is what needs to be our only concern. Are we faithful in God's word? Are we seeking to imitate Jesus? Are we honouring him in all we think, say and do? Are we obeying his commands? Is our treatment of others like that of the Good Samaritan who didn't care about race, colour or creed or like the priests and the Levites who gave the injured man a wide berth? Martha's response was a humbling before Jesus and submitting to him. She gave herself over to Jesus completely and was willing to accept whatever decision he made. Those in the crowd who believed after witnessing what Jesus did put their faith in him. They believed the evidence put before them and concluded that this was indeed the long-awaited Messiah. They accepted him for who he claimed to be and honoured him as their Lord. These, of course, had not yet witnessed the death and resurrection of our Lord, so probably only had a limited understanding of who Jesus really was and what he came to do. But we're here after the death and resurrection of our Lord. We have in God's word both these events, plus we have the writings of servants of God, such as Paul, Peter, James, John, Luke. And through these we have a much greater understanding of what these events mean. In Romans 6 we see that when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, when we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, we go through death with him. As Paul says, when we're baptised in Christ Jesus, we are baptised into his death and that we are buried with him in baptism. So that as he was raised from the dead into life, we are raised with him into brand new life. 
Jesus being the resurrection and the life and having been through the resurrection himself has the authority to grant resurrection and life to those who put their faith in him. So if you have put your faith in him, you've gained for yourself a most wonderful future. A future that is beyond anything we can possibly imagine. We get a glimpse of that in the book of Revelation. But it's only a glimpse because words could never describe it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven. I know that this man was caught up into paradise. He heard inexpressible words which a man is not allowed to speak. Now it's generally accepted that Paul was actually talking about himself but he couldn't possibly put into words what he'd experienced. Now, legend has it that Lazarus never smiled, uh, smiled again after his resurrection because what he had experienced in heaven was so glorious that he had never wanted to come back to life. Now, this is only a legend, of course, but it does make you think. Would we be doing our loved ones who have gone... to be with Jesus any favours if God granted us our desires and they came back to us. Let us rejoice in the fact that they are with Jesus in paradise and that it's only a matter of time that we will join them and that together we will sing the praises of our God and worship him before his holy throne. In Revelation 1.17, John was confronted with the Son of God in all his glory and he says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and see, I am alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and Hades. This is the God whom we worship. The God who unlocks death and Hades so that we may have life in him and with him. And I'll ask the same question that Jesus asked Martha. Do you believe this? Shall we pray? O Heavenly Father, how great is your name. How wonderful are your deeds. Oh dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for raising Lazarus from the dead so that we may know who you really are, that you are indeed the resurrection and the life. Father, may your holy name be praised forever. We humble ourselves before you and give you thanks. Amen.